to the messenger of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose, art, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those to who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each one according to your deeds. Now I say this to the rest of you in Thyatira and to you uh, who do not hold to her teachings and who have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will, to the end I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod, with an iron scepter, and he will dash them into pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says uh, to the churches. To the messenger, the angel of Thyatira, and it's interesting to think about the name and to also connect possibly with a time period that Jesus is speaking to his church in a certain time period as he looks, uh, as John writes this, he's writing of things that are current in Thyatira, the church there probably started by Ephesus or perhaps even Lydia, who was from there. Remember when Paul went to Philippi and uh, there was no synagogue and he went to the riverfront because when there's no synagogue and there's not enough people to have a synagogue, it takes a certain number to have a synagogue, then people would meet for prayer along the river. And so Paul went there and he found a women's group. And he shared the gospel and Lydia responded to the gospel and she was a dealer of, um, of dye and uh, special fabrics, and, and she was um, a, a very influential and um, perhaps wealthy lady and probably went back uh, to Thyatira and was probably a part of that church. We don't know. There's some speculation there. But just thinking about how things start, how they get where they are, and how they are um, guided by God into the future and how they are brought correction and how they're brought um, just confirmation from the Lord. And so Thyatira is an interesting name if we look at this as a time period of 600 A.D. Um, into the current. Uh, this church is one, is one, the last four churches that we're going to look at in the Bible here in, um, in this passage in the first uh, chapters 2 and 3 about the message to the churches, the last four will be around when Jesus returns. I'd like you to look with me at verse number 25. Only hold on to what you have until I come. This church will be there when Christ comes. Now, some people say, Pastor, you're kind of like, we don't know about uh, you projecting that this is God not only speaking to a direct church in Thyatira that John was overseeing, but you're projecting that as there's a mail route that goes around uh, in these seven churches, because there were more than seven churches, as the message traveled from those churches, there seemed to be uh, an order in traveled, and the, the message is listed in the order of that mail route. But when you look a little bit closer, you begin to realize that some of these churches no longer exist, and yet Jesus is talking about them, that they will be there when he comes back. So that kind of suggests to us that maybe we're not taking too much liberty to say 
that there are these churches, there are seven churches, they were literal churches, but that there are also, Jesus is addressing the church throughout church history from John's day on until Jesus comes back. Because the last four have notations about Christ's return and them uh, being in that period of time when Christ comes back. So we do think that there is some, um, that, that, that leads us to think that maybe Jesus is talking more about than just that one literal church in John's day, but that he's speaking throughout the ages to the church. This is the message of Jesus to um, the church and the churches. You'll notice it says in this, uh, to the message to the angel of the church of Ty- Thyatira, but it's also saying about let the churches know this, speaking of more than just one. And so I believe that this message is preserved for the whole church and all of church history, and there are some dimensions that Jesus wants to speak to us about what is yet coming in church and what has, it, which was not yet in John's day, which has come to pass even until today. And so we seem to think that, that Jesus is referring to a literal church, but that he's not limiting himself, that this prophecy is very multidimensional. One of the things that might lead us to, to know that it's multidimensional is he's addressing people like Jezebel, uh, who was an Old Testament type. And we're going to look at her today because he's addressing a spirit of Jezebel in a church. A woman named Jezebel, maybe there was. But it seems to be such a type, the Nicolaitans. And there were, there were literal Nicolaitans, but, but the name and what it means and how a church will struggle with, with giving ministry away to lay people and, and wanting to take it back, uh, the clergy taking it back. And there's all these kind of things that seem to indicate um, the teaching of Babylon, for instance, which was a thing that happened in the Old Testament. But we see Babylon emerging in the 20th chapter of Revelation, and so we begin to realize that in this teaching that Jesus gives us, there's, he's using typologies like Babylon, like Jezebel. He's using things like Nicolaitans, and he's trying to communicate to the church of that day, but down through the ages, he's trying to communicate to the church that's not yet, that has come in our day and has, has um, come to pass. And we look back on this thing where John was looking forward to this thing. And so as we read and understand that there are seven periods of church history that Christ is speaking to, we begin to, to see that these things, in their order, were messages that happened in the past. And it's kind of revealing to us, because Jesus knows he would write that way. Now, there's no way I can prove any of that. I can only say that things suggest Here's four churches that are spoken to being around when Christ returns who are not around today. So it had to be more than that is what my thought would be. So I want to kind of look at that. And if the Lord is trying to communicate, kind of a slip a message on down to church history, don't you want to hear what that might be? And Jesus is addressing things before they happen. He sees them coming and he brings correction before they even happen because he's timeless. He can do that. So, let's look at that. These are the words of the Son of God. Now, Jesus reveals himself, a piece of himself, like in chapter 1, we see the revelation. John was to write about the things which he had seen, which was the revelation of the glorified Christ. His hair was white as snow, and he had a sash, and his feet were bronze, and his eyes were like fire. His voice was like many waters. And this whole big revelation as John turned to see and hear, to see the voice that was speaking. He saw a revelation that was complete, but he only gives a piece of that revelation to each different church. And the piece that he gives to each individual church is what they need to see, a revelation of Christ that brings correction to them. Now, this morning, we were in prayer meeting at 8.30 over here at, the, at the, the house over next door. And we have a prayer meeting at 8.30, and we pray. And, and one of the things that was spoken in this prayer time, we try to not only talk to God, but we listen and we share impressions and things that the Holy Spirit 
um, speaks to us through um, analogies and, and remembering the word and different ways that God speaks. And we kind of talk about those things. And one of the things that we found ourselves praying for or is that, that, you know, people, without a vision, people perish. They wander. They go astray. And if you don't have a correct vision of who Jesus is, you know, you're going to live out your vision. And, it, and if it's an anemic vision of Jesus Christ, you're going to, um, that's going to affect the way you live out your Christian experience. And so Jesus wants you to have a revelation of who he is. If you understand who he is, it's going to affect the way that you do life. There are so many people. How many of you know this? Uh, there is a certain uh, culture, especially in the Bible Belt, um, um, and it, it's typified, in my opinion, it's typified by our culture and the emergent uh, kind of songs that we hear from country music. And who is the vision of Jesus to a country musician, typically? Now, there's some born-again, on-fire country um, musicians, and I want to say, yes, go. And I even like uh, some, of the, some of the country, and I, I like it when they rock out more now than they used to, and I, I'm kind of listening to it a little more than I used to. I don't know if it's my age or if it's whatever. Um, but they're, they're, their lines are pretty funny, you know. I want to thank God for rain that causes corn to grow that makes whiskey. You know, that kind of, you know, uh, funny kind of, kind of um, country western, um, you know, bet. But the same guy that will sing that song will also sing about, you know, thank God for unanswered prayer and the good Lord up above, you know. And it's the man upstairs and it's the good Lord. And if you, if you have a vision of the God of, country music he's he's pretty anemic he kind of winds up the world and leaves him on his own but he's up there watching you but that's about all you're going to get uh he's not going to intervene it's not a revelation of jesus who's going to come and intervene into your life and change things it's not a revelation and if you have an anemic revelation of who christ is it's going to affect the way that you're living your life and so having a full revelation, before my revelation of Christ and my thought of my own responsibility as a pastor was to grow the church by programs, and I had a revelation through God speaking to me about the stacked deck, and it changed my whole paradigm, my whole vision of Christ and his role in the church and my role, and it changed the way that we do church today because God showed me a revelation of who he was and my part and his part. And it changes the way I do church. It changes the way that I look at you today. That God writes things across your heart, brings you in, and we're to speak into that and bless you and watch what God will do. And so that revelation has changed the way that, that um, God has birthed his church here. I was in the way. I was perishing without the correct revelation. My revelation of Christ was not adequate. And these people needed a revelation of who Jesus is. Now, the name Thyatira means continual sacrifice. And we look at the church in this period of time, and it's called the Dark Ages from 600 A.D. Last week, we were, um, we were talking about Pergama and uh, the unwholesome marriage of church and state and Constantine and him coming in and, and even the church taking money from the state and an unhealthy marriage kind of thing happening where the church was once persecuted and growing and purified, now it's taking on the world and becoming more like the state and compromise is beginning to happen. Well, Thyra Tyra takes the start of that and continues it down through uh, another few hundred years until we get this kind of church that we're reading about today. And that church in that dark ages, it produced the dark ages because the church was not the light that it was called to be. It began to be more, um, you know, gaining uh, territory by acquisition, taking and, and buying more land and big cathedrals and, and, um, and having a presence that they had never had. They had met in homes and they had met on the, on the temple porch in big groups and they would meet wherever they could and now... There's like homes of, of giant cathedrals and church uh, cathedrals are being built by, with, with even government money. And the church is uh, losing its kind of 
Christ is the author to the state influencing it, and it grows into this monstrosity, and it's because they don't have a revelation of who Jesus is. Now, how does Jesus reveal himself to this church? Well, I want you to notice what name he uses. These are the words of the Son of God. Now, what was Jesus' favorite name in the Gospels? What did he call himself? More than any other name, what did he call himself? Son of Man. Why? Because he's God in the flesh. You want to know what God looks like in the flesh? Here I am. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Son of Man comes not to kill, you know. The Son of Man comes to give life. The Son of Man. The Son is not referred to in this wake-up call is not the son of Mary as much as the son of God. And that brings a correction. If you limit Jesus to the son of Mary and you elevate um, Mary then more than the son, then you're going to be in trouble. And this is the correction that Jesus gives of himself to this time period and to us and to everyone throughout church history who will read the message that Jesus speaks and his word goes down through the ages and it's quick and powerful and it brings correction and it straightens us out and it keeps us on course. He reveals himself as the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire. I see things. I see things and I see... You, do you remember how... Um, it, what is it in 1 Corinthians that... That God looks at things like with his eyes blazing with fire and he tests each man's work. Some works that we do are what? Wood, hay, and stubble and some are gold, silver, and precious stone. And when the eyes of fire of Jesus sees the work that we're doing, is the work we're doing birthed by the spirit or is it in the energy of the flesh? And his eyes are seeing things that are probably birthed not so much by the Holy Spirit, but by the energies and the thoughts of man. And so he's revealing himself as the Son of God who has eyes like fire and feet like burnished bronze. Now Jesus has walked where no one else has walked. He's walked in the fire. He was there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's in the fire. Brass speaks of uh, judgment and bronze speaks of judgment and the fires of judgment is where Jesus is walking he says if you see me as a God who judges who sees the motivation behind the work and who is the son of God it will bring you to where you're getting off course do you see Jesus with eyes looking at you seeing beyond your works the motivation of your heart is it is it birthed by faith and trust in the Holy Spirit, or is it more along the line of uh, doing something out of guilt or obligation? He sees that. His eyes of fire see that. He is the Son of God, and he walks, and he brings about this sort of correction and judgment of our works. Not judgment of, our, of us as, and our souls. Our souls have already been judged on the cross, and we're set free, but our works are judged. And he's given a vision of who he is, and it's a going to bring correction to this uh, church. Now he says this in verse 19. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Wow, that is so good. That is so good. They not only did good things, but it was on the growing. They were doing really good things, and Jesus is looking at it. Now, today, if we're, it, it, it looks like we're going to look at that time period when, when the church became the, Rome, the church of Rome, and some of you think, oh, no, he's going to bash Roman Catholics. Um, I want to tell you something uh, before we start. First of all, come back next week because we're going to bash the Protestants. If I'm bashing, we're going to get to, to the rest of us later. So I'm an equal opportunity offender. And so if you think I'm going to do that, but here's what I want to say. I think that there's a problem anytime you're just blindly following. It doesn't matter what, uh, what church or what group. Because here's a group of people that are impressing Jesus with their works. They've done good things, works, um, their service, their faith, and their love. 
You know, when you think about the um, when you think about the Catholic Church, they've done some really good things with um, hospitals. They've done things with relief work. They've done things with um, uh, burn centers and educating and education. And their service is born out of faith. Now, anything that's faith is going to be gold, silver, and precious stone. Anything that's guilt or trying to look impressive is wood, hay, and stubble. So the eyes of Jesus look at this church, and, and if you're offended that I'm being nice to Catholics, I, I have no apology to you either, but Jesus sees good things here. And uh, I don't know what you think, and I know some people that just absolutely um, hate the Catholic Church. And uh, I don't think what I see here in this passage of Scripture, um, to those who have not given over, God judges us individually. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, There is the whole of the church, and there is things that Jesus is going to bring correction to. But here he's complimenting. He's complimenting this church. And this is that... Uh, when church and state were joined together and progressed into this church age uh, that we're looking at today in Thyatira. Now, I think it's interesting that their name means continual sacrifice, and we'll get with that just in a little bit. Let me bring that back around because I think that's going to be uh, really indicative of some things that God wants us to see with his eyes and get his perspective, okay? Now... um, The perspective is given here of the good things that they are doing, Uh, the deeds, the love, the faith, the service, the perseverance, and that you are doing more than you did at first. And I want to say that I want to I want to say that God has His people scattered at every different kinds of group there is, and there's a bunch of good people doing some good things here. And the Lord's going to compliment that when He sees it. He's going to compliment that, but He's also going to call and challenge the same time. And that's what he does with us, right? I'd like to read this. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By teaching, she misleads my servants into uh, sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. And I have given her time to repent for her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her to suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. And I will strike her children dead. Then all of the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds. And I will repay each one of you according to your deeds. So there is this individual response and there's this collective correction. And that's how the Lord sees this church. I think it's how he sees every church. And uh, I want to think about this a little bit because who is Jezebel and why is Jesus going back into the Old Testament to, to, to take a figure, Jezebel? Well, in Kings, do you remember what happened um, with Jezebel? She was a wicked woman and the king of Israel married this wicked woman and she began to influence the kingdom. And she was a, uh, a very wicked woman. She was into idolatry, and she was inter- interested in bringing something from Babylon with her, incorporated into Christian and Jewish, uh, into the Jewish uh, law, and trying to mix um, something of idolatry with what God had established. And so, folks, this, this is, I think, the message that God wants to speak to us today is, is you take Jesus for who he is in the word and you don't add your own thoughts into and bring other stuff with you. It's like God is not calling anybody to be, um, to be like an American build your own meal kind of religion. It's like, oh, you know, a little bit of Buddha over here and a little bit of Muhammad over here and a little bit of Christian. Oh, the cross, you got to bring that into the thing. And you kind of bring in whatever you want and kind of create your own religion. And that's kind of what Jezebel was doing. She was trying to, to kind of bring with her from Babylon and introduce some things that, that, that were unhealthy for Israel, and it was the demise of the nation of Israel under her that God came and he corrected her. Now, do you remember what happened? Elijah's there, and Elijah is calling 
you know, in Mount Carmel, he's calling it out. Let the real God show up. And you remember what happened. He said, bring on the prophets of Baal and do your little thing. And whatever God answers by fire, that's who we'll serve. And if it's Baal, follow him. And if it's God, follow him. Do you remember what happened there? The prophets of Baal and their, the, the Babylonian influence of religion had no power. And you know, they're calling and they're cutting themselves and yelling and screaming. You know what that's what false religion is? It's like... You got to do it yourself. You got to make yourself hurt. The more you hurt, the more you, you know. It's it's absence of grace. And uh, the the prophet's kind of sitting back, enjoying his time. And he says, "You know, you should yell a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping." And so they yell louder. And you know, you don't. One of the things you realize when you're serving the living God, He wants it more than you, and you don't have to yell at Him. And uh, have you ever been to churches that do a lot of yelling? It's almost like the louder you yell, the more anointed you are and the more God comes because maybe God isn't quite hearing you. And there's this lot of yelling and stuff and, and uh, a lot of manipulation and a lot of hype and trying to work things up, you know, to get God to come. And nothing happens. So he's yelling again. Maybe he's on the toilet. Yell a little louder. You know, and he's just being obnoxious, as a prophet can tend to be. And nothing happens. And remember, they're in famine. There's no water. And so they, you know, he has them prepare the sacrifice, and he dumps water all over it to make it more difficult to catch on fire. And there's water running, and people are saying, you're wasting water. But he knew what was coming. And he called down and God answered by fire and he consumed and lapped up the water and the sacrifice. And uh, people began to see who God was. They didn't have a revelation of God. Why? Because there was someone deluding God and dumbing God down from who he really is and introducing their own concepts of other religions and trying to bring about this kind of okay for us kind of religion. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And that was the day that God answered by fire. Now, what's interesting to me is that right after this event, what does Elijah do? He gets afraid of Jezebel and he runs. He says, nobody, I'm the only one left. And God says, I've reserved myself a bunch of prophets back there. Get over it. You know, I know you're depressed. Here, have some special food and uh, have some biscuits and, you know, and he, uh, here's this food, and get up and, you know, get with it. Uh, and God spoke to him in the still, small voice. You know, he came, you know, we, we know all this story. But here we are, this, God goes back in time, and he goes to Jezebel and said, you know, this church is going to be guilty of bringing Babylonian kind of influences with it. And what began to happen when church and state combined, uh, what began to happen is we had these pagan kind of cathedrals and they christianized them they, they took some of the some of the statues and stuff and and wrote early church fathers on them and and they brought candles and and they started you know praying and talking to these things and and uh, before long jesus is saying i want you to take notice that there's kind of this jezebel bringing into the church this unwholesomeness and you're trying to combine other religions and false religions from Babylon into the church, and I don't want that. And I'm walking. I I am the Son of God, and my eyes are like fire, and I'm walking among you, and I'm going to bring about some judgment here. But it's not going to affect everybody because some of you have not given yourself over to this. And so Jesus comes into this church. And... uh, I find the word tolerate an interesting word, don't you? The word tolerate is used uh, two times in here. He says, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. And, um, and the word tolerate, I can't remember what other verse uh, it is, but I think tolerate is used here uh, in verse 20. And, um, but I think that's an interesting thing that you tolerate. It's not like you really enjoy it. It's like you could go to that kind of worship thing and you can put up with it, but the Lord says, don't tolerate it. It's, it's like it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you want to back away. And he says, don't, don't tolerate this. 
don't tolerate this. I'm calling you to be my people and to come out and to make your stand. Well, here's a church that's trying to mix, and they, no use wasting these great cathedrals, these pagan worship centers. Let's make us Christianize them, and uh, and uh, let's let's have some of the relics and the remains there, and and let's try to baptize that and make it okay. And it's a toleration that the Lord seems to uh, be upset with of of this Babylonian paganism that came in to the church at this time. Now, remember what Jezebel also did. Her, her, her husband was a king, and he's kind of wimpy. But he's acquiring all this land for himself. But one day he's kind of moaning and, and whimpering. He goes, you know, what's, she says, what's wrong? He says, well, I've got all these wonderful places, but there's one place left that I don't have. And I've gone to Naboth, and I want his garden, and he won't sell it to me. And so, and she goes, you're the king. I'll get it for you. Just watch me. And she had him done away with. And then he grabbed the land and apprehended it. And uh, that was the sin that she had led um, the nation of Israel into legally apprehending and taking uh, land. There's a lot I could say about that. Um, I don't think I want to go there. Um, but this, this verse 20 speaks about this, this tolerating, this idolatry within the church, as, and Jesus refers to it in strong terms. And, and it kind of like, come on, it's not that strong. And, and he says, yes, it is. And this is the terms he uses. Look at verse 20. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads many servants into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, I don't think that they were literally sexually immoral, but I think that immorality is always the term that God used when Israel was unfaithful. They went whoring after. Remember God told the prophet Hosea to marry this prostitute, and then go back and redeem her. And that's how God felt about Israel going after other gods. And so God is always using the terms of the breaking of the heart and the heartfelt things that he feels and likening that to uh, idolatry is like immorality. And so God is saying, you're tolerating something that breaks my heart. And I want you to stop that. I want you to stop that. I've given her time to repent, uh, and I'm not tolerating her anymore. You're tolerating her, but I'm not. And this is what he says. Um, She's misleading my servants, and I have given her time to repent for her morality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her to suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all of the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to the teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will impose uh, no other burden on you. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. That's kind of interesting, even though they have this Jezebel taking and mixing paganism with something Um, Christian, they do have something that's really solid and they believe in the deity of Christ and that he is God. And he says "There's, there's, there's a lot to hold on to here and there's a group of you who have not tolerated. You have rejected bringing in all these other things and you've kept your focus on me and you've not given in to the secret things. Now, the secret things speak in this time period, I believe, when the Bible was chained to the pulpit and the Bible was taken away from man, and, and, and now services were celebrated in a language that nobody else could have. And so only if you really want God, you've got to go through someone else. And um, there's these secret things that, only, that you've got to get help with in getting to God. And I think God says, you know, there's a group of you who don't buy that. You go directly to me. And you don't have to pray through anyone else. You go directly to me. And you have something good, and you hold on, and I'm with you. Isn't that good? So be careful of cursing 
everything because Jesus is not cursing everything. He sees into the hearts of individual people. Now, that's my problem. You see, I'm kind of like, I want to just get them, you know, and then until it comes to me, then I want God to be nice. But I, I think what I hear the Lord saying in this time is there's something to hold on to and uh, don't give yourself into that. Don't tolerate that stuff that's not uh, for me. Don't, don't go and give yourself into the secret things of Satan. There's nobody that's got all these secret things, these mysteries, these secret things that you've got to go somewhere else and get. The Lord is a God of revelation who reveals himself, and he will reveal himself to who he wills, and those people can follow Jesus, and God will stand with them. There, what do you think of that? And there are these people. And, uh, and they've not given themselves to these so-called secrets. And I will impose nothing more on those people and hold on to what you have until I come. Hold on, I'm coming. I'm going to come, and you're going to be around when I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority to the nations. Now watch this. Now we know that this is not just coming in a time period, but it's coming when... Um, authority over the nations is given, so we know it's the end times that Jesus is referring to. This church is going to be around when Jesus comes back, and Thyatira, is, as far as I know, is no more as a church. Uh, it's in the Turkey area, and that's a very dark area. To have so much influence in one area, and then there's nothing now but darkness. And it's because the church wasn't standing up. But there, here's the deal. The Lord says, I'm going to be with those who don't yield and tolerate the stuff coming into the church that's not for me. I'm going to stand with those people. And I'm going to be strong with them. Now watch this. He says, and when I come, guess what I'm going to do? To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. And he will dash them into pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. Now, who is the morning star? Jesus. If you're going to stand firm, you're going to get Jesus. You like this? If you're going to stand firm until I come, I'm going to give you a, a, an iron scepter to rule with. And the things that are of clay and not of me, the wood, hay, and the stubble stuff, the energy of the flesh stuff, you can take your rod of iron and you can smash it. And that's how I'm going to use you because you believe in me and I'm with you because you believe in me and you're not tolerating this other influence coming into the church. You're not, you're not jumping on the bandwagon of using guilt to get people to do stuff and the energy of the flesh to do stuff. You're looking to me and I will give that person the morning star and I'm going to give them a scepter of iron to rule with and they're going to be able to smash the earth and stuff, the stuff of earth and the stuff of man because the kingdom of God marches on and it's eternal. And we have a God who's risen from the dead who goes before us and he goes before us and he says, I'm coming back and when I come back, I'm going to give you this though look at verse 29 this was brought to me this morning in prayer meeting um, some of the guys were talking about verse 29 and isn't this interesting this is how the lord approaches you today hearing this message he who has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches there's a message in every church for you and for me now i've got ears to hear i've got i can literally hear and you're all literally hearing but it doesn't mean you have a place in your heart to hear what God is saying, where you're going to open the door for Jesus to come into that area of your heart. What is the Lord saying here? I, I just, this, is what, this is the big piece of revelation I want to give you today to walk home with. This is the good part. Are you ready? The good part is, is that God is preparing people who don't want to tolerate what isn't of God and mix down and dumb down God because they want God to back them from heaven. They want to stand with God. And anything that's in the church that is of man and of earth, God says, I'm going to give you authority to smash it because you don't tolerate it. And I'll give you the sun and he'll back you up. The morning star will be there and I'll give you a rod of iron, to, a scepter of iron, and you can smash the clay, earthen kinds of things that come into the church. And if you've got ears to hear what I'm saying, there's a blessing and an authority that you will walk in that you don't have, that you don't even realize you have, 
But if you have ears to hear it, you're going to gain authority. You're going to stand up and you're saying, I'm not going to tolerate any more of this, you know, God and man kind of religion. We want Jesus. And anything that's birth of Guy Fawkes, may it die. Anything birth of the Spirit, may it live. And may we have the audacity, and may we have the authority, and may we not be tolerant, but may we walk in the authority of Jesus with him, the morning star backing us, and may we smash the earth and stuff of the church. May we not tolerate that which is not birth of the Holy Spirit. May we see a church in her glory and the splendor of what has been birthed by the Holy Spirit that man cannot duplicate. Folks, we want to see a church that God builds, not man. Are you with me? We want to see something that only God can do. God's architecture and builder is God. That's what we want. And that's what the Lord is saying. Hey, there's a lot of stuff coming of man coming into this church, and you're tolerating it, and I call that spiritual adultery. Don't tolerate it, and I will stand with you. Now, if you've got ears to hear what I'm saying, okay, I'll, this is the closing remark. Oh, this is so good. I want you to go with me. It's so good. 2 Kings chapter 9. Because I believe, one of the guys in study group this week brought this out and just nailed, just nailed it, I thought, for us all. In, in, go to 2 Kings, but in 1 Kings, remember Elijah's challenging the prophets of Baal and he, the real God stands up and he writes, those sons of Baal and they killed all the prophets of Baal. But what did he do with Jezebel? What did he do with Jezebel? He ran in fear. And what happened to Jezebel? She kept doing it. Now, he, he, he goes on to be with the Lord and this is what happens uh, to Jezebel. And this is how the Lord deals with her. He says, you remember, I'm going to deal with her. Watch what happens. In chapter 9, Jehu is anointed king of Israel. Now watch this. The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you get there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of um, Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him into an inner room. Then take this flask and pour it, the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run and don't delay. Now this is really fun. I love this. So the young man, the prophet, went to Ramath Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. And the commander said, uh, for you, the commander replied. And Jehu got up and went into the house. And there the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anoint you the king over the Lord's people Israel. Here it is. Watch this. Here's your mission. Here's your mission. Verse 7. You are to destroy, you are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of the Lord's servants shed by, by Jezebel. And the whole house of Ahab will perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave and free, and I will make uh, the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of uh, Nebat, and like the house of uh, Basha and the son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jahaz, and, uh, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and ran. When Jehu went out uh, to his fellow officers, one of them asked, Is everything all right? What did the madman come to you? Why did he come to you? And so they're calling the prophet a madman. Now you know why he didn't say it in front of them. He says that, and he says, um, you know the man and what sort of things he says. Jehu replied, that's not true. They said, tell us. And Jehu said, here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I will anoint you king over Israel. They hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him and bare, um, on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. 
So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of these people, conspired against <laughs> them. And, um, and uh, against Jehaz, uh, king of Aram, and king Joram. And they returned to Jezreel to recover uh, from the wounds uh, that they had inflicted on him in the battle. And um, anyway, what happens is, um, he says, uh, get the horse and... Um, and Joram ordered and sent him to meet, verse 17, them and said, Did you come in peace? And the horsemen rode off to meet Jehu and said, This is what the king says. Do you come in peace? Uh, what do you have uh, to do with peace? Jehu replied, Fall in behind me. The lookout reported, The messenger has reached them and he, has, and he isn't coming back. So the king sent a second horseman. When he came out to him, this is what the king says, Do you come in peace? And Jehu replied, what do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. Then the lookout reported, He has reached them, but he isn't coming back either. The driver is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a madman. Amen. <laughs> you ever hear this thing, he drives like Jehu? Now, I want to tell you that God really liked Jehu, and Jehu drove like a crazy man. I like that. He didn't drive a Buick either. Uh, hitch up my chariot. And uh, Joram ordered, and when he, when he hitched it up, Joram, king of Israel, and um, Azariah, king of, um, boy, I'm butchering these names, Judah rode out, each to his own chariot to meet Jehu, and when they met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth. Now, Naboth was the guy that they sold his property. When... Um, when Joram saw Jehu, he asked, Have you come in peace? How can there be peace? Jehu replied, As long as all the idolatry and witchcraft uh, of your mother Jezebel around, abound. And Joram returned and, and fled, calling out, um, Treachery! And so Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram, uh, Joram between the shoulders, and the arrow pierced his heart, and he slumped down in his chariot. And now he goes on and he goes up to the window and he says, hey, who's on our side? Throw Jezebel down. And they threw her down and she splatted. And this is gross, folks. This is rated R. Um, two or three units looked down and says, throw her down in verse 32 and 3. So they threw her down and some of her blood spatted on the wall and, and, um, and the, um, the horses as they trampled her underfoot. And Jehu went in and ate and drank and take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she, is, she was a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. And when they went back and told Jehu, uh, he says, this is the word of the Lord that was spoken through the servant Elijah, uh, the Tishbite, on the plot of ground of Jezreel's dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. And this was prophesied, folks. Now, here's what I want you just to take home. What Elijah, what Elijah did not do, Jehu did. Sometimes I think, I think God is waiting for you to stand up and not tolerate, and he wants to give you an iron scepter to smash the earth and stuff in the church. And to say, we don't want to tolerate the things born of flesh and earth. And what Elijah did not do, Jehu was anointed by God to do. And I wish that the Lord would anoint us as a church and as a movement of churches to um, give us the authority of the morning star with us and a scepter to smash that which is of the flesh that is seeking to be brought into the church just as Jezebel polluted the church, there are things that the enemy wants to send in among us that are not from God, and we must stand up and take the authority and say, no, we're not going to tolerate it. We're going to smash it. Because the anointing of Jehu, who drove like a madman, had an anointing to deal with what Elijah didn't have the fortitude to deal with. And God is looking for people. I believe God is looking for people today who will stand that God can back, 
who will stand up and say, we're not going to tolerate the church born of man. We're not going to introduce um, awful things that are unbiblical and Christianize them and make them look okay. We're going to stand up and God will stand with us. And this is where we are called to live as a church. Now, this is also true in our own lives. The Lord comes in his jealous love for you, and he says, what are you tolerating? What are you tolerating? If you stand against it, I'll stand with you, and I'll give you a rod to smash it. And I believe the Lord is jealous. He doesn't want us to be attached to anything that will take our love away from him. He's a jealous God. Had the anointing of Jehu, and for Pete's sakes, the gas pedal's in the right. Pick it up. <laughs> Amen? So can I bless you with the Jehu blessing? No, I, I, I mean, he was anointed, and when he was anointed by the prophet, he stood up and did what was right. And God's looking for people to say, man, I'm, waiting, I, I'm ready to move here. I wonder who I can really go that will really act in faith that, that I can go with and smash this. I wonder who will go with me. Think about that. I'm going to ask the worship band to come back. And... Can we stand together?
I love the words of that song, I'll Rise When I Hear His Voice. I wonder how many of us have ears to hear that the Lord would speak something to you, something incredibly, an adventure of faith, something that looks so impossible, but yet you're hearing the voice and you're rising up and say, Lord, go with me, give me the scepter. And I, I, I'm going to tell you one thing I hear the Lord say, I think, and it's, I think that the church is to take the arts back. And... Um, one of the things I really feel like the Lord has been telling me, and I can't do it myself, and I, I, uh, I can't do anything myself, and my wife reminds me of this all the time. Because <laughs> she runs the business, and I just start things. And, but um, here's what I've learned. You know, I, I, here's what I'm hearing the Lord say. Um, the arts, you know, I, I think that, I think God, with, with today's culture and the Internet, um, it's so reasonable to take video and um, use it for cool things, like doing shows and videotaping, and they're making enough money doing that that somebody could actually, we have writers in our fellowship here that could write screenplays and make, I think we, I could see us, and I know it looks impossible, and you say I'm a dreamer, but I really don't care. I think if you hear God's voice in what I'm saying, listen. I really think the Lord wants to birth something here with video productions, and I don't know what that is exactly looking like, but there's no reason why we can't be doing movies. And we're, Don't think I'm crazy now. If you've got ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, rise up. Would you do that? Maybe we ought to just have a meeting. That's just one thing I've been hearing God say. I know there's many other things that the Spirit would be saying to each individual, and what we're to do as a church is to come beside people who have ears to hear and are hearing God and they want to express that to come and say, how can we help you do that? How can we help you follow Jesus and lead us in some way to follow him with you? And I just think that the Lord is saying that. And so in a couple of weeks, let's do a lunch and maybe people get together that want to do, take the arts back and want to do something. Maybe we could have a lunch after church and see something emerge, because I hear the Lord saying that. Maybe I'm nuts. Am I nuts? Well, don't take a vote, because <laughs> I may not survive that vote, but I really do think it's the Lord, and if you got ears, and if you're hearing something the Lord say that to you too, man, let's do it together. Can we do that? I think that's where we're supposed to go. I know it's one of the things I think we're supposed to get into, that the Lord has kind of been echoing and echoing in me that I can't let go of, so... Lord, would you take us where we are, but don't leave us where we are. Would you, would you do incredible things that can only look like you did them because it looks so impossible for us? Would you do those kinds of things among us that we may marvel at who you are, that we may marvel at people who listen to you and follow you and step out in faith and take new territory for your kingdom? Lord, we want to give you this place I pray that you would anoint some Jehus here with the rod, a scepter of iron to smash and to raise up and lead in ways that you want us to follow you. Lord, where are those people? I pray that you would anoint them today in Jesus' name. Amen.